Hi, everybody. It's Andrea, president and co-founder of the Stigma Free Society. Welcome to our Facebook Live event where we interview people with lived experience of mental health issues, experts in the field, and generally just really cool people who come to share their story and their passions with Stigma Free Society. So today I have John Bateman with me. So welcome, John. So wonderful to have you. It's excellent to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Excellent. So uh, before we get started, I am going to share a little bit about the Stigma Free Society for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, the Stigma Free Society is a decade old registered charity that is located in Vancouver, Canada. And so the Stigma Free Society was first a genesis of my own personal story uh, with a diagnosis of bipolar. And really what we focus on over the last decade is to really lift up the personal stories and lived experience of people who face stigma in many forms. And that generally has a focus on mental health and mental illness. So you can come to our website, stigmafreesociety.com to learn more. So let's jump right into it uh, with our wonderful guest today. I'm very excited to have you. And I'm just going to have a very short bio. I'm very surprised a lot of the bios that I read are a little bit more extensive. So I feel like, you know, this is going to be pretty easy. So I'll just give your three line bio. So John's experience with anxiety began at a young age. It wasn't until more recent years that he found relief through cognitive behavioral therapy, which is also called CBT. John's passionate about starting a conversation, glad you're here today, and sharing his experience with others in an effort to normalize anxiety. So I'm very excited to talk to you about this, John, because we haven't had a guest on yet over the last year who has talked about their experience with anxiety and I thought what would be a great way to start is maybe share a little bit about yourself, your passions, where are you right now, and um, perhaps a little bit about growing up and the diagnosis of anxiety, and, and what was that like in your early life? Okay, for sure. Uh, physically, where I am right now is a place called Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, uh, and um, I've been here for 20 years, been a visitor here for 35 years. Um, it's a great place to live. In terms of where my anxiety started, it, it was at a very young age and it didn't so much look like anxiety. And there's a lot of people who I believe don't understand what anxiety is or they don't have a definition of it. Mine started out as essentially uh, temper tantrums, acting out, stomach aches, all very common symptoms in childhood anxiety. And um, they started out, you know, when basically my parents uh, split up when I was five and they stayed in that form, um, I'd say probably till I was about 10 or 12. And, and you know, I was still living a, a good life, you know, what I consider to be a, a healthy childhood. Um, I, I From that point, I wouldn't say I'd experienced anything traumatic. I, I, I had access to both my parents and both my parents were uh, very lovely and respectful. Uh, so I've had really good experiences with them. But then uh, when I was about 11, I'm guessing, I had my first a panic attack and panic attacks are you know this this sort of small intense period of anxiety um, that can be very crippling very upsetting I didn't know what was happening um, I had it because I saw a commercial on TV that was scary about the end of the world uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s it was you know um, yeah nuclear war all that kind of stuff and that really scared me a lot existential fear kind of things um, and so my mother was very enlightened with this whole anxiety thing. And she kind of saw it coming down the track, which I was very lucky that that she was that way in the seventies uh, because um, it was, if you know, if you think mental health is still has stigmas now, imagine what it would have been back in the seventies. So she actually got me into a psychiatrist probably around that age. And, and that's when I first sort of found out what panic attacks were and what anxiety was. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, that back then it, it kind of came and went, I would get distracted a lot. I'd be distracted for months at a time with my friends and just having a normal little childhood. And then I'd have panic attacks out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, knowing what they were didn't really help 
in terms of you know how I felt. It, it didn't really help me that way. So that's the beginnings of my anxiety, and then it it escalated from there. But that's that's sort of the 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 early the early years of my anxiety. How would you define anxiety for somebody who's watching right now? And we know there's good anxiety and normal anxiety, like when you get up and give a presentation in front of a class, you know, you get that fluttery feeling like that is normal, right? But what is it like when somebody's suffering from anxiety? So yeah, we, we have anxiety that we all have when we perhaps are writing an exam, perhaps when we're, you know, driving along the highway in a snowstorm or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and that anxiety is there to pretty much prepare you for what you're experiencing or what you're going to experience. Um, and that's like you say, that's good anxiety. That's survival anxiety. Um, anxiety can roll over at that point into something that, that you'd call more chronic or generalized. And mm -hmm. that is having that anxious feeling wherever you experience it. Some people in their head, some people in the in their chest, some people in their stomach. Um, you know, some people, it's a whole body experience is a very unpleasant experience. And that st sort of sticks with you for a longer period of time. It, you know, you may call chronic anxiety, you know, once a day for a week or, or you know, I've experienced it certainly all day, weeks at a time. Mm. And I, I, I sort of differentiate that kind of anxiety because it really affects every aspect of your life. It affects your relationship with your family. It affects sleep patterns. It affects diet. It affects your ability, in some cases with me, to even, um, you know, get out of bed and, and brush my teeth. So that is really the challenging, more chronic anxiety. And, and, and the one that I specifically have historically had a lot of problems with is generalized anxiety disorder, um, which is a kind of anxiety that can glom onto something and, you know, whether it's and it can even start in kind of that benign, you know, good anxiety kind of way, go along to something like being afraid of flying, uh, which I, you know, I have been historically. And um, and then, you know, you go on the flight and then once you land, you don't uh, or I in that case, don't get relief from that anxiety and the anxiety just keeps going on. And since it's generalized, it will find something else to grab onto. Mm -hmm. And then that in turn can start you down a road of rumination, cyclical thoughts, yeah. certainly um, negative thoughts uh, and irrational thoughts. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. I have a loved one very close to me who has uh, generalized anxiety disorder. And a big thing for him was social situations mm -hmm. and, um, you know, self-medicating with alcohol to be able to deal with those situations and still feeling so much overwhelming anxiety. Uh, luckily, he got the help that he needed. And I know that a lot of people decide if it works for them with a doctor's prescription, medication mm -hmm. can be an option. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people may not want that, but there's other things that they can do. So what else can they do? Um, so aside from, you know, you know, I, I, I've certainly been medicated and um, I really I, do, I don't, it's a personal choice and I do not, one of the things I don't like, I, do, I, I, I don't like stigmatization of, of mental health as yeah. it is, but I don't like stigmatization of medication either because yeah. I know it has actually saved a lot of lives um, and we all can approach it in different ways. Um, I always strive to, if I need to be on medication, to be on medication, but then still the trick is while you're feeling good to deal with those things that may be causing you, you know, the anxiety in in the first place. Yeah. So in terms of if we step away from medication and in terms of, you know, how I deal with anxiety, let's say on a day to day basis, um, anxiety, there's there's countless tools that people use. Uh, you know, there's there's, of course, I think universally important is sleep. I, I think that's universally important is good sleep. Um, I think also universally important is is diet um, is is what you're putting into your body. Um, you can certainly be moderate with that. Um, you know, I, my only real vice in life is sugar and I, it's a battle with me all the time and sugar can cause anxiety. So I have to really be careful with that. Um, but outside of that, you know, I've tried a lot of tools and one of the lessons I learned about tools is first of all, not to throw too many tools in at the same time. Mm -hmm. First of all, because it's hard to tell what's working and and it's uh, and it's hard to explain, but it's it can be really possible that addressing 
the situation or addressing your mental health can cause the 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 the, the uh, process of addressing it can cause you more mental health problems, if you know what I'm saying. It's easy yeah. to obsess about, oh, I should be journaling now. Oh, I should be exercising now. Oh, I should be going to sleep Small right steps, now. Small steps, right? Now. Small yeah, steps. Yeah. So what I started doing <laughs> is I started implementing little tools, a yeah. few tools at a time, and then I let natural selection take place. So I tried meditating, and I just found myself not wanting to meditate. Not So it it, it from my mental health perspective, it naturally selected itself out. Um so, you know, for me, I stick to the basics. I stick, I, you know, sleep works for me. Certainly talk therapy works for me. Mm -hmm. um, transparency works for me in terms of sharing my experience. Um, that benefits me on a mental health level as well. Um, socializing, I know, is important. And then one of the little ones that I always jump to is if I'm in a state of anxiety, having an ability to find something to look forward to. Um, maybe it's an hour from now, uh, you know, a uh, uh, half a day from now, a day from now, a week from now, maybe tonight. And and having that one thing that you can kind of hold on to because it kind of helps pull you out of the moment and, and pulls you out of that physical anxiety experience. Those are the ones that I that I use right now. And, and it will probably change, but that's where I am right now. Yeah. And so you've used CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and probably a lot of people don't even know what that is. Right. And so I know it's been helpful for you. And can you explain like first and foremost, like maybe a a general definition for people and how has it benefited you? So cognitive behavioral therapy, um, I ran into it when I got into basically a, a psychologist suggested that I try a cognitive behavioral therapy group course. So it's like a, maybe an 11 or 12 week course where they teach about cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy is basically, uh, you know, from my perspective, how I see it is addressing your thought processes and how they affect your your life uh, physically and emotionally because humans so often are just in this autopilot and we are often um, having negative thoughts. I'm um, not really, you know, we won't touch a hot element. We'll stay away from scary things out there, but we don't ever, you know, sort of guard ourselves for scary things in here. And, and mm -hmm. what happens is our, is our brain starts creating real neural pathways and, and that path gets well-worn in negative trends. So no matter what is kind of going on, your path, your pathway will kind of bring you towards negative thoughts, bring you towards anxiety. And cognitive behavioral therapy helps you slowly check those thought patterns and fix them. And it's a it's a longer process. Um, it's a slower process, but you can really jump in right away and I find it in a lot of people, there's a, a you know a tremendous number of studies for the last 40 years that show that it's a very effective technique for dealing with anxiety. Yeah, I experienced a lot of anxiety in my past when I was first diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And a lot of times with different mental illnesses, that anxiety component can get combined and be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I suffered with a panic attack and it was so overwhelming to the point of thinking I was going to die and running to the hospital. Yeah. Um, have you experienced panic attacks? Is that something that you've had to deal with? And how do you explain it to somebody if they like have an experience like that? The, the first, oh, yes, I've experienced panic attacks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I've experienced them mostly uh, right out of nowhere. Um, but where it, essentially there's no tangible or emotional trigger that I could identify that caused it to happen. And that's really disconcerting. And that's really, it really takes you out of, you know, your balance and really takes you out of being grounded where you are. Because for me, a, a panic attack is a really abrupt ungrounding. It's, um, it's very floaty. It's very scary. It's, uh, it can cause uh, a huge myriad of physical sensations, you know, tingling, sweating, a uh, rapid heartbeat, uh, feeling faint, uh, nausea. It, it's a tremendous amount of things. Uh, but most of all, it's a feeling of sort of pure dread um, and, and not knowing exactly why. So I, I've experienced it many times. And, and you know, um, what I learned about dealing with panic attacks, and I think this is really important that people understand this, is that panic attacks have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, and that length of time is usually 
not significant. Um, a panic attack, I've never had one that's lasted more than, say, almost, I'd say five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. You know, of course, there's a recovery time, but uh, panic attacks, yeah, they... Uh, and so now I haven't had one in years because of the way I think about this. This is kind of a cognitive behavioral therapy trick. It's just reminding myself if, if when cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you don't want it. There's a there's a thought process called process called catastrophizing. And that basically means you blow a situation in a proportion and you give yourself anxiety. Uh, it's easy to start catastrophizing in a panic attack. Um, mm -hmm. And. And if you can remind yourself that there's a beginning, middle, and end to this, that the end is really close, um, yeah. they they diffuse them. They they diffuse a lot better. They're not as severe. So that's that's where that's what I recommend. And, and again, uh, a little bit of practice, but you might find that you have great success with it right away. Yeah, I learned over time for me personally that uh, when it started happening, that I recognized, okay, this is a panic attack, and then rationalized through it was really helpful. There was a time where I did need um, some help with medication when it yeah. was really overwhelming, but I never, sure. you know, needed to stay on it. Uh, yeah, definitely meditation, mindfulness. Um, I also did dialectical behavioral therapy, yeah, uh, which is yeah, definitely a good one uh, mm -hmm. in parallel to. The work you've done with CBT as well. Mm -hmm. So learning and talking about anxiety, experiencing anxiety, this has uh, led you on quite a path to be an advocate, a speaker. Uh, I really want to know about your work with Anxiety Canada. Who sure. is this organization? What they do they do? And what's your role with them? So I met Anxiety Canada. I, um, <clears throat> I was a sitting chair on the uh, Bateman Foundation, which is a foundation started by my my father and my family to basically experience uh, nature through the lens of art, kind of what, you know, if you know Robert Bateman, that's kind of what it is. And um, we had formed a partnership with Anxiety Canada, and I happened to go in and uh, meet uh, Judith Law, who's the executive director of Anxiety Canada. And, and I was already well into kind of my transparency as in talking to a lot of people about uh, as in doing what you know you what you do is is basically refusing stigmatization and just being open with people about it and, and I find that's a really helpful thing to do for me and for other people that's a different topic um <clears throat> so then met with them had a really great conversation really great time with Judith and then I got home and the next day she called me up and she asked me to be part of anxiety Canada's champions program and the champions program is basically a number of people who who have, some level of notoriety um, who are um, experiencing anxiety and want to help Anxiety Canada in, you know, perpetuating their mission and uh, their goals. And their goals are are basically, you know, what you would expect is to is to help people uh, understand, learn, and deal with anxiety. And they have a lot of incredible um, sort of services and tools that do that. And and they're like 95 percent free so what what happened was you know we got we we were doing about i'd been about six months into the champion thing and, and you know uh i didn't want to become an apathetic champion if you know what i mean i didn't want to become yeah, a champion by, by name and uh and that was it you know just walk around and brag oh i'm a champion um so i decided i want to do something and originally i was doing a lot of walking at that point uh to help with my mental health um mm -hmm. situation and uh I was thinking about doing a walkathon, and I thought, uh, you know, to raise money and awareness. And I thought, oh my gosh, like literally everybody has done a walkathon. Every cause has done a walkathon, um, and so I think that's a well-worn path. So I thought I started thinking, you know, what are my strengths, and 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 how can I contribute to them, and how can I, you know, contribute in a way that is comfortable for me and that is different. And so I came up with this concept and and worked on this concept of what we called a talkathon with Anxiety Canada. As you can tell by this interview so, so far, I don't have a hard time talking. Um, yeah. It's something I, I, I just, I guess I'm just boring with. And, um, and so we, we, we did this, um, what this day on World Mental Health Day a few Octobers mm -hmm. ago, and we set it up like a literal talkathon. We, we, I did eight <laughs> hours straight live interviews, 32 people I interviewed. And, I don't doubt it. Oh, uh, <laughs> And it was, I mean, it was, it, it definitely gave me a lot of anxiety. So, it, oh. but it went off really well. And, and, you know, it, it was successful in that sense. But then we thought, you know, 
um, let's try and do it a different way. So now, so it, it basically turned into a podcast now um, that we've just released season three, I believe. And then uh, we just released a few special uh, interviews a couple of weeks ago on World Mental Health Day. Um, no, Bell, let's talk. Um, yeah. And um, <clears throat> so it's called Our Anxiety Stories. Technically, it's called hashtag Our Anxiety Stories, which can be found at anxietycanada.com slash Our Anxiety Stories or po podcast platforms. Um, and now we just have controlled interviews, so to speak. So I have interviews 15 to, if they're good interviews and the people are willing, they go half an hour, 45 minutes, and we talk about their anxiety story. And it's great for um, me because I, again, I love meeting and talking to people you know, like you. And um, and I uh, and I think it's their important stories to tell. And for people who aren't really ready to be out there, it's really important for them to hear they're not alone. And that's sort of the fundamental, uh, that's a foundation of our anxiety stories. Because I love alone, that. yeah, aloneness is a big problem in mental health issues. You know yeah. that too. Yeah. 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 And so you're sharing your story really so to ensure that people don't suffer in silence like you once did. That's really mm -hmm. what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very admirable. Mm -hmm. And was there like, I'm just curious as we're talking and going on the fly here, I was curious about was there, I call it like the coming out moment for me. Uh, I spoke in front of 500 people back yeah. in 2009 and kind mm -hmm. of admitted I have bipolar, but it's okay. Did you have yeah. some kind of moment like that? So but my moment like that was I was, you know, writing for, I write a, a humor or I haven't, I, I stopped, but I wrote for 12 years, I wrote for a, hum, a humor column for a magazine here on the island. And, you know, we've got, you know, Salt Spring, we've got about 12,000, 13,000 people here. It's a small, it's a small number of people, relatively speaking. Yeah. So I had been writing a column for probably about, I don't know, maybe it'd been six or seven years at that point. And, and it's always funny. It's it's always a humor column. Um, that's kind of part of my thing. It's it's weird trying to mesh <clears throat> being a, a humorist and a mental health advocate at the same time. It's a hard line to follow. Yeah. Uh, so so we um so then I, I just hit a wall and started going through some really bad anxiety and depression. And I wrote an article about it and submitted it instead of my oh, humor wow. column. And I got a tremendous amount of positive feedback within the community from that. And that's yeah. when I realized, hey, you know, not only to help me um, to be out there and to, you know, because it it, de it helps destigmatize, you know how that works, um, but it, it help it actually helps other people. And that's where it started to feel good for me. And then I just started, just let it fly. Uh, you know, <laughs> you probably know kind of once you have broken the dam, it, it's quite easy. You know, yeah. how's your day? Oh, I'm suffering from generalized anxiety today. Uh, if you don't know what that is, what happens is, and it's like, you know, just explain or whatever it ends up being. And the thing that floors me about transparency and about, you know, being open about it is that the number, and I'm sure you've experienced this, the number of people that when you mention it to them, either they themselves experience something. They or someone they know. Yeah. Someone, not as somebody they know, like somebody huh? close to them, you know, brother, yes. sister, mother, father, child. Yeah. Someone they love. It's incredible. Um, and then that, I think that helps really empower people to go down that same road. And, and I think it's very, it's a very, um, you know, healing process. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I get a little piece of my heart back every time, even like 12 years later, just sharing about it sometimes mm -hmm. when you get like, you know, amazing feedback or little emails, like, thank you. I don't feel so alone. It just really, you understand, like it, yeah. it makes it so worth it. Right. Totally. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So say there's someone watching and they're like suffering and they think that this may be because of a potential generalized anxiety disorder mm -hmm. or they're just feeling not well with anxiety. They don't know what to do. What are some like first steps that people can take? For sure. Uh, the, you know, the first the first step, if you're if somebody's listening or looking at this um, is to really understand the fundamental thing that I still go with is you're not alone. Um, there's, if you walk out onto a street, uh, you know, say, a, you know, you're, or you're in a cafe, let's say there's 25 people in there. <laughs> Statistically, there is five to seven people in there that kind of have um, sort of what I would call a life interrupting mental health issue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to remember that, that, that you are definitely, on. that's the first thing. Um, the second thing I say, which is often the hard part, um, and this is where we 
where you you know work on on breaking that stigma is talking to somebody and mm-hmm. and really anybody. Um, it can be a parent, um, it can be a spouse, it can be a friend, somebody that you feel like you have you know some confidence in. Mm-hmm. I really recommend that. And third thing is um, get some help from a medical professional. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, I know you know there's that that money can be an, a you know a hindrance to some people, but there are a lot of community things. Um, there are a lot of organizations such as yours, uh, Anxiety Canada, um, you know, Bell. Let's talk. There's a lot where there's a lot of free information for you yeah. to go and access that right away. Um, you know, Ang- Anxiety Canada has a free app for dealing with mental health issues. Uh, so there's a lot of organizations that are there, literally just a Google search away. Um, mm-hmm. that can definitely help. Uh, yeah. That being said, if and when you can, there's nothing like talking to a person um, about it, yeah. uh, whether yeah. it's professional or whether it's uh, just an empathetic ear. That's that's very important. Yeah, that's what I always say is a lot of times when someone's going through a mental health struggle, like I know I didn't want a lot of advice and that became very overwhelming and having Mm -hmm. a listening ear was just an amazing place to start. Mm -hmm. And also we can go into walk-in clinics and talk to doctors who can link us to psychiatrists. I know Mm -hmm. obviously there's some uh, worries about barriers and and wait list times, but there is also peer support groups uh, Mm -hmm. for this kind of thing. And I recommend everybody going to the Anxiety Canada website where you can be linked into various resources. Mm -hmm. Google has a lot of different uh, uh, websites and information, but I feel like the hub of Anxiety Canada would be a great place to start. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention, because you you said it, Something that was transformative for me in my journey with anxiety is uh, through the cognitive behavioral therapy, you're in a class essentially learning with a bunch of people. Um, and my experience when I went in there and started, it went in there the first day, and it's also because I'm in a small community, um, but I walked in and there's this moment of uh, all of a sudden there's a, a, a humanization of people experiencing the same thing. They're sitting right there and, and it works on an even different level with me because I, I knew everybody in the room. Um, yeah. And I was like, you like, really you, how is that possible? You know, your life is so together. How is that possible? And um, that's really helpful meeting with just mm-hmm. people. You don't have to know them, but meeting with a, in a group setting, I know there's lots more online now that the, you know, yeah. COVID has changed the way we meet one another. It's yeah. easier to get together. Some people are more comfortable with it that way. But in person, if you can get into group, online, if you can get into group, it's remarkably valuable. I, I yeah. highly recommend it. Yeah, there's many uh, virtual online mental health groups now. I know that uh, we're connected to one uh, pay pay what you can peer support, I believe is the name. And you can do, you know, participate for free or just pay what you can for the facilitators running the virtual groups. They're out of Ottawa and they have like 50 groups. And I believe one specific to anxiety as well, which Mm -hmm. is really helpful. Totally. So as for stigma, just uh, closing off on the last two questions, um, like we have, you know, that internal stigma where we're shameful, Uh, Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about it. And you mentioned uh, shattering that internal stigma by reaching out and talking to people and knowing that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Say on a societal stigma level, what can we do to fight the stigma of anxiety? Um, If you if you feel confident enough and brave enough, um, do what, you know, you and I do which is mm-hmm. it, you, you don't have you don't have to join an organization you don't have to become a champion but within your friend group or within your work environment or within your school environment um you know share that uh in this day and age i'm outside of the tiktok generation i'm outside of the social media generation i know that there's a lot of negative that happens in social media, but I also know there's a lot of positives. Perhaps there's avenues there um, where you can open up. I, I know that's how a lot of youth connect now. I know my generation doesn't completely understand it, but this is the new paradigm for them. And, and it's not up to me to try to change them back to the way it was with me. Um, so I think, you know, I think opening up about it on your personal level, mm-hmm. if you feel like joining, you know, volunteering for an organization um, or volunteering to, you know, to talk about it or just, you know, going out and just asking a friend if they're feeling okay, just, and, and, you know, trying to get behind the, 
default answers that we always give in our day-to-day -day life, which is, you know, mm -hmm. how are you feeling? Great. See you later. Um, I, I recommend, you know, maybe once in a while, uh, if it's not too te heavy, tell somebody, you know, oh, I'm feeling anxious today and I don't know why. Uh, and then I find it spreads. Um, it, it propagates on itself. And um, that's, that's what I suggest. Within your comfort zone, um, you know, communicate with people. Yeah. Yeah. One of the great things, too, I, I really like that advice is say, for instance, at Stigma Free Society, we have guest bloggers. And so we've had bloggers who have shared their personal story, only use their first name or not a name at all. Mm -hmm. So it's just a personal contribution that is both healing for the person and then brings awareness into the world. So there's a lot of creative ways that people can contribute. Uh, I know a lot of times, uh, you know, people just aren't ready to come out yeah. and have that, you know, that very uh, strong stance, but if yep. actually a lot of people do. So yeah. you know, start small. And that's completely fair. Um, yeah. Because, you know, that if you're already feeling emotionally raw, um, yeah, going out and saying, hi, I'm John Bateman. I live here and I am feeling horrible. I have anxiety. Um, that's, that's a different level of, you know, sort of revealing yourself. And I, there's no expectations to, I don't think so, expectations to give your whole self away. Um, yeah. You know, like you say, I think I think that's, if somebody's blogging anonymously or just using their first name, I think that's completely legitimate. Um, and because and I, I think you understand when you read the blog, you know, and I've looked at your blog, um, it's uh, it's a real story. And, um, and that really, I, I think it's really helpful for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, we're coming to a close. Okay. Um, thank you so much, John. I just wanted to close off and just ask you if you have any advice for anyone who's struggling with anxiety. Is there any last words you'd like to share? Um, sure. Uh, if you're struggling with anxiety, um, yeah. Uh, understand that this is something that happens with a lot of people. Understand that uh, it's very common. It's built into the human body. Um, and understand that there is now more than ever uh, a myriad of ways that you can tackle this problem. Um, this is all in addition to what, what we just said about talking to somebody in, all addition, in, in addition to that and, and the fact that you're not alone. But understand that right now, um, thanks to the good work by, by Stigma Free Society and Anxiety Can and all the other organizations, this is the best time to be jumping in and dealing with this. So jump in and deal with it and uh, and you'll be able to get control of it. Amazing. Well, thank you for igniting courage in people, John. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your contribution to the world mm -hmm. and it was an absolute pleasure to work with you, but please uh, stay on the line and then I'd like to thank you personally before yep. you leave. Yep. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Where can people find you or your organization or where you'd like to refer people to? Well, I, I, I right now I refer people to Anxiety Canada. Um, in terms of me, I do have an Instagram uh, page. I'm, I, am I John? Yeah, John, J-O-H-N underscore R underscore Bateman uh, for Twitter and, or no, for Instagram. And then mm -hmm. um, Facebook, I think I'm John Bateman. You can find me. It, it, it's under <laughs> John Bateman. I'm Just in a, can us, I'm in we'll a canoe. You know. I'm in a canoe. I'm, I'm, I've got a toucan. Uh, you know, I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. so, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I, I really appreciate it. And I love to talk with you guys again. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, we're closing off for the Stigma Free Society Facebook Live event. Uh, today, we were talking with John Bateman, and we are so excited to move forward with our series next week. So please check out the Stigma Free Society website, stigmafreesociety.com. Drop us a line, provide us with any feedback. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And thank you so much if you are watching today or if you're going to be watching after the fact. So thank you, everybody, and have a lovely day. Thanks.